My name is John Barnard and I'm the designer of the first MP4-1 carbon monocoque Formula 1 car. I had uh, just returned from America and I'd finished the Chaparral IndyCar, first ground effect IndyCar. Ron gave me a call and I went down to Woking, down to his office at Woking and that's where we started talking. In starting to design the car I wanted to bring something, I thought well I've got here, I've got at least a year where we don't go racing. So I want to bring something new, if I can, to Formula One. I mean, I'm, I'm a great believer in, if you want to lead, you've got to be the first one to do something. So I got talking to some people at British Aerospace. That's how I started to understand and learn a bit more about the carbon composites. And I thought to myself, at the time we had ground effect working on the cars, so we were able to do the shaped underbodies and, and skirts and so on. In order to optimise that, you needed as wide a clean underbody as you could get. And that meant making the monocoques, which at that time mostly were made from aluminium, sheet aluminium with some steel reinforcements. In order to make that smaller so that I could get a wider underbody wing, I was going to lose torsional stiffness. So I thought, well, how do I get the torsional stiffness but still be able to make the monocoque narrow? And that's when carbon really came to the fore because it has properties that you can't beat. I mean, you know, weight, strength, stiffness are just superior to aluminium and steel. And I said to Ron, I think I want to try and do this monocoque out of carbon. What do you think? And, you know, Ron said, yeah, great, you know, if you think you can do it. The advantage of the carbon was that you could effectively lay it up in a mould and make it more or less any shape you wanted. That achieved a monocoque that had effectively no joints. The only joints would be when we fitted the, the seat back panel and then there were two extra stiffening uh, panels inside the monocoque that glued and bolted inside together with a single front bulkhead that mounted the suspension. The monocoque had, I think, five pieces in total, which compared with the standard aluminium monocoque at the time, it would have been hundreds of pieces. So that's the way I planned to go. The problem was then we had to find somebody to make it because we didn't have facilities with autoclaves and so on. Ron and I approached several British companies who were doing carbon composites in various things like helicopter blades and that kind of object. And they basically said, you're crazy, it's far too complicated, we don't want to get involved. And then through someone I knew in America, through my time I'd spent in America, someone had been a student actually at um, Hercules in Salt Lake City. And he said, oh, they've got a big R&D department dealing in carbon composites, maybe they'll be interested. So I got the name of the guy, it was a guy called Bob Randolph, running this thing. And Ron being Ron immediately picked the phone up and said, you know, I want to talk to Bob Randolph. Um, and we did, and within a couple of days we were on the plane out to Salt Lake City. We took what was in fact our wind tunnel model. It was a one-third scale fiberglass model of the car. Ron got a great big box made, all foam lined, and we checked it in on the plane we were we flew to Salt Lake City. So when we arrived, we had the set of drawings in this great big model <laughs> of, the, of the car. And they were immediately, wow, you know, we've not done anything like this before, but we'd love to have a go. So that's how the first ones were made. The first monocoques were actually made over there, although we made all the tooling, all the design and everything in England. When we got the first monocoque back, we were going to torsion test it. So we built a, a, a simple torsion test rig but then we tested it and we found that the torsional stiffness was like, gosh, two and a half times more than what a conventional aluminium monocoque would be. It was weighing about the same as a normal aluminium monocoque, but something like two and a half times stiffer. So I thought, well, actually, I want, to, I want some of the weight back. So we reduced the second monocoque. The layup on the second monocoque was reduced the number of plies per skin was reduced and we ended up with a with a compromise still much stiffer than an aluminium monocoque I remember something like 11 or 12,000 being a figure but then we saved 
something like 30% of the weight. So I now had the balance of weight and stiffness about right for what I wanted. We're talking March 81 now, and the first car, the first carbon monocoque, Formula One car, hits the track at Silverstone. There were lots of emotions. I mean, don't forget this whole program had started back in like November of 1979. And now we're in March 81. So, you know, that was the gestation period for this whole process. My feelings were, it's worked. We're here. We've done it. But there were still lots of unknowns. There were still people walking around saying, oh, wait till it has a big accident. It'll all explode in a cloud of dust, etc., etc." So there was all those emotions going around, lots of comments, you know, like everything that's new, everything that's different is, there are always people saying, ah, I don't think that's correct, I don't think that's the way to do it, I don't think it'll work, da 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 So now I had to make sure it was going to work, I mean it was all very well getting it on its wheels as a complete finished car, now we had to make it work. So that, that progression happened through, well up until we won the British Grand Prix in, in, in 81. Previous races, we'd been third, second, and then British Grand Prix first. I mean, you couldn't write the script, could you? You know, just gradually working your way up. And which one do you want to win? Well, I want to win the British Grand Prix, don't I? And that's what we did. So that was an amazing, amazing time. And, you know, we got our reward. There was still a lot of people saying, what's all this carbon monocoque about isn't it just an expensive way to make a monocoque you know what's the benefit blah 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 John Watson our driver at the time well one of our two drivers we had John Watson and Andrea de Cesaris the young guy so John's John's driving the car at Monza he's in practice and he's I don't know he's doing about 150 mile an hour through this corner he gets it wrong and he puts two wheels on the curb and loses it the car hurtles across the other side of the track, smashes into the barrier, and suddenly there's this huge flash of flame, which turned out to be actually it hit so hard it snapped the gearbox casing and the oil came out and flash fire on the exhaust. The engine and everything gets ripped off the back and I mean we're watching on TV and the first thought is, oh my God, this is a big one. This is not going to be good. And anyway, all the dust settles, all the smoke settles. John undoes his straps, steps out of the monocoque, starts walking back, looking at his engine and gearbox and sort of generally looking around at the bits and pieces. And that accident set the tone for the carbon composite monocoque from there on after. It then became not a question mark what would happen in an accident. It became, if you like, the beginning of the safety cell. So it was really a huge moment in the whole carbon composite monocoque chassis if you want life you know of, of from that point on that question went away so I can remember being contacted by the CAA the Civil Aviation Authority in Britain asking me if they could come and look at our composite monocoque because they were in the process of trying to draft rules and regulations for carbon composite aircraft and they didn't have the information. They wanted to come and see what happened to a monocoque. So I remember them coming down and looking at where the engine mounts and everything had got ripped out of the monocoque. The big thing with the monocoque was that the damage was local. The engine was ripped off, but the damage was local. Like quite often with an aluminium monocoque, the whole monocoque would buckle. You might pluck the engine off, but, you, but it would do lots of other damage down the monocoque. And this one, it was just local damage. They were interested in that to see it, um, which I thought was, it kind of illustrated how advanced we were in carbon composite structures, which I thought was, um, well, I was quite chuffed with that. <laughs> A year or two after the first Formula One car, journalists used to ask me, what do you think? Do you think this is going to end up in road cars or is this another one of those esoteric Formula One things, you know? And I said, I think it's got to come. It must come because it brings with it advantages you can't get any other way. You know, weight and strength and safety and so on. I look back and think, actually, it was my idea. I actually decided to do this Formula One monocoque out of carbon composite. And 
and here we are now, you know, I mean, I've just driven the one of the latest McLaren road cars with a carbon composite monocoque. And I suppose I can't help sitting here thinking, yeah, I started that. <laughs> Maybe I haven't finished it, but I certainly started it. I mean, I've driven a number of high performance cars in my time. I've driven the McLaren. I drove the first MP412 and I've just driven the 650S. And um, I mean, it's impressive. It's amazing. It's um, very drivable. I mean, you're talking, what, 650 horsepower. I mean, that's, that's a lot of horsepower. It feels incredibly solid. You go over some bumpy roads, but there's just nothing. There's just no shake, no rattle, no nothing. I mean, it's, it's really, really solid. To be able to have that much performance, I got in within two or three miles, I was completely comfortable driving this, this car just you know a high performance you know a supercar basically and I'm here I am toodling around on normal roads to have that envelope of, of huge performance and drivability I think it's impressive that first carbon formula one car set the pattern for McLaren McLaren from that day on never made a car that wasn't carbon fiber chassis and that's how I think of McLaren you know it is the carbon composite car company